Welcome back guys and welcome to another episode of Connecticut Angler. I'm actually just taking a walk in my woods here uh, to do the intro for this episode because although it is early March and as you can see, forest is still very snowy. The episode you're going to be watching today I actually recorded in early February, except that for one reason or another I either deleted or managed to have corrupted files for the videos I recorded for the intro, so here I am recording the intro in early March, even though this episode comes from early February. So in this episode I'm going to bring you guys along where we fish for wild brown trout in a small stream in Fairfield County, Connecticut in the dead of winter. And uh, I wanted to go through, go ahead and make this episode. even. Even though I lost the original intro footage because I feel like there's there's a lot of value to these small stream videos in wintertime. Fishing these small streams for wild trout in the wintertime can be a really challenging experience even if you're really accustomed to fishing on small streams frequently, both in terms of challenging your skill and challenging your perseverance. Uh, to go out to a small stream which during the warmer months of the year maybe you'd expect to catch a dozen fish per hour or more and struggling all day and sometimes not even seeing any apparent sign of life on these same streams in the wintertime. Uh, that can really test you in a lot of ways as an angler. I'm not going to ramble too much. We're going to get right into it. Uh, but yeah, so secret stream why Fairfield County, Connecticut, purely wild brown trout. Let's get right into it guys. Water is crystal clear. We have had uh, a real cold snap over the last couple days. And although it's above freezing today, uh, we still have a lot of lingering shelf ice as you can see. Okay, shelf ice is going to be a real pain. You know, I have uh, the rubber boots on. <laughs> uh, rubber boots are great in a way. They prevent snow and ice from caking up on the bottom of the boot. But they come with a very distinct downside, namely that they're extremely slippery. Whether you're talking about wet rocks or shelf ice like this, felt sole boots are always going to be far, far more stable. Okay, really nice little pool here. I don't want to get too close. I also need a decent vantage point here. Water load it. That's it. Got him. Got him. Oh, we lost our first fish. That fish took the egg. Ooh, we have lost our first fish officially. I definitely saw the flash of that brown. Uh, but this is a great opportunity to sort of discuss a wintertime small stream trout fishing tactic here. A facet of successfully fishing small streams in the wintertime. Namely that um, in many cases, these fish, when their metabolism is um, you know, significantly reduced with the, with the cold water, they're not gonna wanna move very far to take a fly. And you may think to yourself, well, you put, I mean, I've probably cut a lot of drifts out that I made. I put probably two dozen drifts through here before that fish finally took, seemingly right through the same drift. And you might think to yourself, well, why did the fish decide to hit only two dozen drifts in? And the answer is, 
And the fish probably watched the flies go by all of three inches away on all of the prior drifts. And that particular drift, uh, the, the flies just happened to be just about directly in his feeding lane. So it was easy and he went for it. So often when I'm fishing small streams in the winter time, I make a lot more drifts through a given pool than I really would during the warmer months when you could expect a fish to move if it saw your flies at all. Because sometimes you're really gonna need to bring that rig directly to the fish in the winter time. But anyway, let's see if we can uh, find another fish. Fish is just racing upstream. Oh, I got him. All right. All right. This fish took the zebra midge. Gorgeous wild brown. Beautiful spot pattern on this fish. Put up quite a fight. In spite of this water being frigid, I mean, my hand is so cold even just holding this fish right now. Just beautiful. And what a privilege, what a privilege. All right, guys, there we go. First fish to the net. Uh, and really only like five minutes after I lost that other brown just uh, 20 feet you know, further downstream. And quite a fight that fish put up. Uh, I mean, decent size for this stream. And that fish was probably about 10 inches or so. If I had to, if I had to guess, I have the measure now. I forget to use it all the time. So that fish took the number 18 zebra midge. That is the point fly, the trailing fly on this three fly rig, which I will go over a little. Uh, I will go over those flies a little later on in the video. But um, yeah, not bad, not bad at all. And an awesome fight. What a privilege it is to be out here and to be hooking into fish in spite of a river that seems like it should be virtually dormant, right? Even though it's we're only in like the first week of February these fish are out here and they're eating and we're gonna try to catch a couple more okay climbing up on the uh, the rocky sort of riprap on the bank of the stream here going around a lot of this fast water where I think it's highly unlikely that we can find much of anything right now and instead I'm moving up to um, another really gorgeous pool up here Look at that pool, guys. Look at that beautiful scene coming right down the pipe. I mean, there is scarcely a more textbook spot to catch a trout. If we don't get one out of this spot, I don't know, maybe I should just turn around. <laughs> hey. Let's get it. we we'll start at the rear of the pool here. I want to be able to actually walk about three or four feet further upstream. But if there's a fish right here, I don't want to walk up on it. So I want to try to catch any fish that may be right at the tail out first. Then I can move up a little bit closer. Got one. Yep. There's one at the tail out. See, I would have missed this fish. I would have entirely missed this fish, no question, if I had just basically walked up on top of it. Yeah, got him. This fish also took the zebra midge. Interesting. That number 18 zebra midge there. Just excellent. Well, there you go, guys. You hear it all the time. Always make sure that you fish the water you're about to walk through. And uh, this is a perfect example of that. If I had walked to just three feet further upstream, which is really the more ideal spot to fish the better part of this, or the, the, the larger portion of this pool, I would have spooked that fish. Uh, oh, pretty much without doubt. And I, that would have been one less fish to bring to the net. Got him, got another. Got another. <laughs> All right. Here we go. 
go guys there's another 10 inch wild brown again just an absolutely beautiful fish put up a fantastic fight such a privilege to be able to catch these fish and and i mean these fish are putting up one hell of a fight just excellent just excellent oh guys i just forgot to turn the camera on and i was like oh man i just made my next cast but it suck if i just caught a third fish out of this tail out on this cast that I wasn't filming. So I turned the camera on, but uh, I think I turned it on literally the mo almost, I mean, a moment before this fish took. Oh, let's get him up here. Oh, my gosh. Got him. Another fish on the zebra midge. Another fish in the zebra midge. This fish is slightly shorter. This is about a nine incher. All right, guys, I still have not moved from the very first position I took to fish this pool at the tail out. And we found three fish stacked up at the tail out here. Got another fourth fish in this tail out. This one also took the zebra midge. It's a smaller fish, but in some ways even more vibrant than the larger ones. Beautiful car marks in this fish. Beautiful varied spots. All right, guys. Well, I think I finally exhausted this tailout area. Four fish. Four fish from this tailout. And I really can't restate enough that had I walked not even a rod length further upstream before I started casting, those fish most likely would not have paid any attention to my flies. They would have been spooked up to the head of the pool. I never even would have known they were there. And I would have walked away from the entire rear half of this pool, or maybe the whole pool, saying, oh, I can't believe there were no fish there. And it really would have been carelessness that would have spooked those fish. So important to cover every part of the pool and, to, and most certainly to fish any water that you plan to walk through. Alright guys, well I just broke my rig off, so I figured now's a good time to kind of go over what I'm throwing because I'm going to have to tie new flies on. I only kept one of the three flies on this triple nymph rig. So what I do is, I start off, uh, the very first fly down from the indicator is generally going to be a heavier fly. In this particular case, it's kind of just a very generic pheasant tail. Um, it's not like a really a perfect pheasant tail, but it's basically just a pheasant tail just uh, on like a size 12 hook It's heavy. It's big. It's what's gonna make sure that the trailing two flies actually get down at a reasonable rate And sometimes I'll also have fish hit this larger fly, fly as well So I kind of prefer to use this approach rather than instead just putting on the lower two flies and adding split shot Next fly down, something that's attention grabbing, but that's also natural and that fish really, really like, and that's an egg pattern. I'm gonna tie these generally in like size 16 or so, beaded egg. And then the final fly, number 18 zebra midge. So I have all those flies, I got roughly six to seven inches in between each one, and then I run them uh, under an indicator. And that's uh, what I've been throwing today, and that's what I've used pretty much all winter. If you're not used to fishing triple nymph rigs, you may think to yourself, boy, what a nightmare to try to manage having those three flies in the line. The rig must get fouled constantly. And it does foul. Usually it's very, very minor though. It, one or two flips of the line, you've got it unfouled. Um, and, and honestly, I think it really increases your chances of catching fish. And I'll kind of explain a little more about why that is as we continue upstream. bit of a trek further upstream we probably went about 80 feet bypassing mostly just ripples and rapids that were definitely moving at too high a rate given these flows to be reasonable places to catch fish right now but this spot on the other hand is looking pretty good
Got him. Got him. Oh, big ice shelf here. Ah, shoot. I did not think about how I was going to get past the ice shelf to land a fish if I did hook one. Yeah, but we've improvised and we got him. He's actually right here in front of me. Just had to get my net, my net out. All right. There we go. See, so took that beaded egg pattern. That's a smaller fish too, six, seven inches. All right, let's let this fish go. All right, guys, first taker on the egg pattern. Not bad, not bad. Now, I told you guys to tell you why I'm fishing a triple nymph rig. Now, you guys might have wondered a little earlier on, you know, if you're getting all of your fish on that zebra midge, why not just fish the zebra midge? Well, there's a couple reasons. Number one, not all fish are necessarily going to want that zebra midge. As you can see, that fish that we just caught, he took the egg. Would that fish instead have taken the zebra midge if that was all I was fishing? Maybe, maybe not. There's no way to tell, but I think we, we can all kind of know through experience that fish are preferential sometimes. Number two, even if all those fish were taking the zebra midge, I think there's a very strong case to be made that having some more visible patterns coming down the stream first, just in front of that zebra midge, may serve to get the fish's attention, and then they take that easier morsel in the form of the zebra midge. So it's worth having all of those flies on there. You will get takes on almost all of them, but those other two flies serve a purpose, right? The egg is kind of an attractor, so is that larger nymph up top, and that larger nymph up top also serves to sink the rig a lot faster. So these three flies have both functional purposes outside of hooking a fish, but also can hook fish. So they kind of double in their usefulness. All right, absolutely fantastic pool over here. Just fantastic. Caught many fish out of this pool before. I'd be surprised if we don't get at least a couple this time around. Now, same thing as before. We have a tail out right here. I don't want to get too close before I put quite a few drifts through to catch anything that may be hanging in that tail out. Okay, nothing in the tail out. We're going to start moving up. Fish took the uh, took the zebra midge. All right, let's get this guy in. Nice, nice. Here you go, folks. Excellent fish. I'll let him go straight away. All right, not bad. Now, you might be wondering, well. Why isn't he wearing gloves if it's really that cold? Well, I, I, I do have gloves. Bring them, bring them out every time I uh, go fishing. I don't necessarily always bring them on the river, uh, but they're always in my truck. Uh, you don't really realize how much having that, that sort of tactile connection to your line matters until you don't have it. If it's even just 25 plus really, I might wear a glove on this hand, but I'm always barehanded. Um, with the hand that I'm using to make bow and arrow casts and the hand that I'm using to just manipulate the rig and the flies because uh, I just need that 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 tactile connection uh, but I think I should mention my time is running low I'm winter time fishing I'm usually not trying to get out any earlier than maybe 11 and um, you know in my experience that's generally the best move if you're not just looking to freeze your butt off for three or four hours before the fishing gets good. Uh, that said, it does mean that I don't have quite as much time in the water because as we get later in the day, of course, I have other things that take care of oftentimes. But uh, yeah, we're running low on time. I don't want to ramble too much about it, but uh, we can really only hit a couple more pulls up here. Then we have to call it quits. So let's see what we can do with the time we got. Oh, 
Well, nothing in that pool, guys. Sometimes you don't get to end the day on your own terms. And uh, that's how it went this time. You always hope to be able to get that one last fish. Sometimes it doesn't come. But it's been a, you know what, it must be kind of louder on these cascades. Let me get off into the woods here, start heading back, and uh, I'll talk to you guys once we're away from the roaring waters over here. I would say this day was quite a success. Several wild browns to the net. So much damn fun. Triple nymph rig really did the trick with these fish. This is really my, my go-to rig this winter and it's been working wonders for me, it really has. The road is right over my shoulder here. I'm about to head over there, and make the rest of the trek back to my truck. So we wrap it up right now. Hope you guys enjoyed the episode. Maybe I'll see you on the river next time. The warmer weather is coming. Hang in there, folks. <laughs> Later.